So congratulations. Aww, thanks, Mary Lou. I love Thank this you. book. Thank you. I need to say that, first of all. Thank you. <laughs> it is so thrilling to know that somebody you have always liked and admired is a really brilliant, talented writer, too, and is going to have such a class, such success with this book. So, but most people here and in this country and around the world, in Scotland and Greece and everywhere, know you as a poet because you have so far five books of poetry, another one coming in September. What, what caused you to move from verse to prose? Mm -hmm. What was the, and it didn't happen just yesterday. You've been yeah. working on this for a while, <laughs> I realize, but. Yeah, well, it's really, um, it's been quite a journey, and it's been an interesting journey, too, because I think at heart I really am a poet. Um, but there's only so much sometimes you can do with poetry. And I think of um, the image of a spring, like a, when it's coiled and it's tight. It's kind of like what you're, what you're doing when you're a poet. You're trying to sort of make this compact sort of thing spring to energy. And I realized in writing prose, it was it's sort of like pulling that apart and yet still having all the links and all of the circles connecting. So it took me a while to learn how to do that and then see exactly what I was, what I was trying to do um, because I am such an organic writer. And uh, so, um, yeah, it just sort of taught me what it needed to be. And I just kind of kept following that along. And um, that uh, I've learned a lot of, uh, about writing through the process. So a lot of the poems were like small pieces of what this was going to be, this, this magnus opus. Well, what's interesting was when I started, I, you know, I'd forgotten this, and then I realized in an early draft, um, because there's an interesting line between fiction and reality with this book. Um, I forgot, I was going to actually, at, at the point when I was saying my thank yous, because I was going to thank my parents, because they died way too young, but they're why I write. Um, there was a Donald, but his name was Graham. <laughs> there was a Rusty, and her name was Graham. And, uh, but they're fictional characters too. Um, so even that scene, my dad didn't actually do that, but I tried to capture the essence of who they were. And I found that with fiction, you could do that. And I guess fiction writers know this, <laughs> but it was new to me. And I thought, well, it's interesting that you take sort of a reality and it becomes its own reality. So it was really learning how that, that world would become what it needed to be. Um, so there's that, that fine line between the two. And then you don't even know. And you think, well, was that, did that happen or not happen? I can't even remember now. So, yeah. So I, I want to come back to the, the autobiographical aspects in a, in a moment, but I wanted to ask you, too, about the name, the title of the book, mm -hmm. Quarry, because Quarry has figured prominently in your earlier writings. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. where you open the book. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's so central to Caitlin's life mm -hmm. and yours. You lived yeah. on a property with a quarry. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so rich in metaphor. You really mine that quarry <laughs> for your book. Right. Um, well, thank you. Yeah, no, I... Um, I mean, that's it. I did grow up beside a water-filled limestone quarry. Um, and it was very, uh, like people in the area didn't even know it was there because forested, it was hidden. There was a public one that people went to and paid to, and ours was right beside it. So it was incredible to sort of, you know, you're looking back as a teenager, you're like, you're so isolated. You're like, oh, why can't I be in town with all that my friends are? But now I see what a feeding ground that was for me as a writer. And Paul Vermeersh, um, who was here earlier, I don't know if he's still in the room, but he's been my editor through all my poetry books here in Canada. And the quarry comes up. It's in every one of my books. And it will be in the celery forest, too. So it's interesting that, again, that you talked about it being a metaphor. And it, it's kind of a metaphor for Caitlin's journey as well. And you know, I've talked about, I think we all carry a quarry inside us, this sort of subterranean past that we carry through our present. Um, we're all multi-layered, and there's all things to learn about ourselves as we move through life. Um, so I just think it's an endless metaphor. So the quarry was a place where you played with your cousin Cindy, a, a, a place you went to for as a haven a lot. Now you're saying Caitlin. Caitlin, Caitlin <laughs> where Caitlin went to uh, as a haven. And, um, but quarry also has a sense of, of hunted, the hunted. Mm -hmm. And when I was reading it, I thought, 
Caitlin is almost also a quarry of the gods. It's as though the gods were jealous of her life because her early life was very happy. Yeah, I think that's interesting too. And I love words that have more than one meaning. In quarry, yes, you've got sort of the, the limestone quarry, the dugout rock, and this just happened to fill with water. And then you have quarry as in you're, you're trying to like get some kind of prey. Um, and, and if you look back too, quarry also comes from kur, which is heart. So it's like the heart of something. And so as poets, we just love these kind of words that do these different things all at once. So as a fiction writer, I was sort of, I guess, playing with that too. So you've got the image and our inner journey through the quarry and all the various layers, and then sort of the way that you're so vulnerable, not only when you're young, but when you're going through grief. Uh, your world is so distorted, and you don't know how to cope. You have nothing to hang on to. So you're just sort of lost. And it's, and so it's unfortunate some people will pick on that, and some will help, but some won't but you think they're helping, <laughs> yeah. So the, the grief, the loss, your parents, Caitlin's parents, her mother first, um, with it, she started to write. She had a professor who became a therapist who encouraged her. Um, you wrote, you started to write. Was that a way of dealing with the loss? And is it still? Well, it's interesting, again, I mean, I mentioned, I don't know if I would be a, a writer otherwise without the loss of my parents because they're so much part of that and through therapy um, because I, I mean this is like an introvert's nightmare <laughs> standing on stage talking to a hero that you're um, you've listened to for years but the thing is as well like an introverts in the I mean I know writers many of you are you're shy you're introverted but your passion for writing and your passion for sharing the story takes you out of that so very much that's what happened to me. So it was really um, through seeing a therapist because people were worried about me. I wasn't knowing how to handle the emotions. I was keeping everything inside. And the therapist suggested keep a journal, started doing that. So yes, there's a release of the emotions and trying to make sense of things. But through that, I organically started playing with words and images and memories. And it was a different feeling. It wasn't just venting things out, it was creating. And it goes back to that idea of poesis, of making, maker. Um, so through that, I kind of found my way as a writer. So it was sort of many branched and again, such an organic process that I don't know. I mean, I look back now and I think I'm kind of the classic sort of writer in sort of um, germ germination kind of in high school, but I didn't have that teacher to spark that. So it came to me in a different way, but at the same time, I don't know if I would be a writer without the loss of my parents. So. I'm just rambling now. <laughs> and now. And now, now you have immortalized them. I mean, they're, they will live forever in this book. Um, it's also a great coming-of-age novel. I mean, apart from the dramatic events that happened to Caitlin, there are the familiar first kiss, first crush, hideous kids at school, hideous jobs. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Darren smoking weed behind the, you know. Um, and did you want to do, uh, read a part from the Clifton Hill, oh, sure. which was sure. one of the jobs? Your first job was as a lifeguard mm -hmm. at a place. Was it Hideaway Park? Was that well, the again, park or the Caitlin. place behind? Caitlin. <laughs> Caitlin. <laughs> Mary Lou, we talked about this. <laughs> How much of the book is autobiographical? <laughs> Give me a few more drinks and then we'll talk. <laughs> Caitlin, so, Caitlin gets a job uh, as a lifeguard and then, uh, and that's really fun because she loves the water. Yeah. And then a little while later, she's persuaded by her father, by Don, to mm -hmm. get a job yeah. in, in some cheesy Niagara Falls yes. setting. I'll read that then. Okay. Now. Okay. So this, you've all been to Clifton Hill or you know about Clifton Hill and how you got the tacky sort of hill versus the beauty of Niagara Falls. So Caitlin is um, on Clifton Hill at this point. I'll just read a little. Oh, okay, a thanks. Oh, thank you. All right. <laughs> After two hours of watching strangers walk by up and down Clifton Hill, I left my booth for my mid-warning break. I walked past Ted's booth, so he's another seller there, an older man and much more experienced, and pumped coins into the Coca-Cola machine. Sipping my Diet Coke, I stepped away from the machine's humming to listen to his spiel. He was talking to a young Asian couple about things that weren't in the brochure. How Superman saved Lois Lane from the Whirlpool Rapids treachery. 
how the first person to tightrope walk across the Niagara Gorge was a Frenchman who called himself the Great Blondin, the fiberglass yellow cap daredevil. That's right, folks. Blondin even pushed a wheelbarrow to the center of the rope where he stopped, cooked, cooked an omelet on a small stove and ate it, carried his manager on his back once he even crossed blindfolded. His spiel then turned to the story of the old scow. Loaded with rock, the scow was being towed by a hydro tug to the upper river when the line broke. Because the bottom grounded in time, the men were saved from the brink. I'd seen the barge. It had shrubs growing out of it. Memorize the points in the brochure, a boring list of facts. Ted's helpful advice, he was telling stories. He was making them see. As my workday neared its den, I hadn't sold one ticket. The closest I came was an older couple who'd promised they'd be back. They wanted the night illumination tour. They loved the photos showing the rainbow effect over cascading water. Niagara Falls lit like magic. My first sale was going to happen. I was sure of it, but it was almost time to go and they hadn't come back yet. On my way to Mom's Malibu, I saw the couple standing under the veranda. They were waiting with others for the evening tour bus to arrive. Hello, you need a ticket, I said, my heart racing with excitement. Wait until I share this with Dad. The woman waved a ticket and pointed to Ted, standing by his booth. He gave us a special discount. Fucking Ted, I muttered under my breath. <laughs> Driving home that night, I stopped at the library and checked out all the books on Niagara Falls I could find. I couldn't cure my shyness, but I could learn the stories behind the facts, spill them out like a waterfall. With all the new trivia stuffed inside me, I came with an idea. I'd make a questionnaire, a did-you-know sheet, use it as a hook. Okay. <laughs> so. Your dad was a salesman. Caitlin's, Caitlin's dad. dad. <laughs> Caitlin's dad. Caught myself. Caitlin's dad was a salesman. And... Uh, how much of the book is autobiographical, Kathy? <laughs> <laughs> oh, everything. No. <laughs> no, no, it really is. It's fiction. I have to say that. Um, because it really was like things that, again, what, and my students know this. I know some of my students here, and thank you for coming. You know, you, you tap into the emotional truth of something. And that emotional truth is what carries you. So there's an emotional truth to the story, but there's characters, there's things that never happen. Um, so what can I say? <laughs> Caitlin's dad was a salesman. And he very, that part's true. And, and, and he, was very, uh, he was very pleased whenever Caitlin managed to you know, have a success at Niagara Falls. But she hated, she hated that kind of work. Yeah. It wasn't her kind of thing at all. Her, no. yeah. um, but you, but you're, you're, you, you were going to read on originally because oh, there's a right. section at the end of that where you yeah. talk about your mother and mm -hmm. the quietness. Yeah. Caitlin's mother. <laughs> well, let's just keep it to that. Okay. Uh, oh, shoot. I'm going to need that light again. Yeah. It's dark up here. Okay. So this is a thing. Um, some of you may have the experience too, Caitlin's experience, where you have parents that are quite opposite. So the dad's the extroverted, kind of charismatic guy, and then the mother's sort of the quiet, sort of calm person, and they work well together. And so that, that's Caitlin's experience here. So it's interesting as a fiction writer um, to sort of work with a quiet character. I believe in quiet. I believe in the power of quiet. And those of you who are quiet know, too, that you're underestimated. People think they know you, and they don't. And then when you do fight back, they're kind of shocked. And it's like, yeah. <laughs> All right, so yay for quiet people. And um, so the mother is very much like this. And I'll just say something here about the relationship between Caitlin and her mother. Mom's silence wasn't calculating or withholding like Nana's. It never made you nervous. Being nervous meant you made mistakes, what Nana wanted. Mum's was an accepting silence. When we lived in Grimsby, while Mum sewed in the sewing room, I played with my dolls and stuffed animals on my bedroom floor. While Mum baked cookies in the turquoise kitchen, I sat at the kitchen table drawing birds with flowers. We shared our silence, immersed in our separate worlds. We didn't intrude on each other. And when the time for showing came, look, Mum, look. She was there to see. She was present. We understood the showing part wasn't where the deepest pleasure lived. That was in the doing and making. Thank you again. Thanks.
that you and Alex uh, talked a little bit earlier about the process of making the book together. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that you have, you've been very, uh, very engaged in this whole process mm -hmm. of editing something that's different from what you've been doing before. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit more about what that was like. I mean, that first chapter, for example, mm -hmm. I was struck by how brilliant it was. Oh. How everything that happens is in a way foreshadowed. You don't know it at the time. Mm -hmm. But it's absolutely, when you go back and look at it after you've finished the book, mm -hmm. it's sensational. Oh. Did, you, Thanks, did it just Mary come Lou. out like that? No, oh, it never comes out just like that. <laughs> we wish. <laughs> Sometimes it does, little parts, but like... How, how much conscious craft was mm -hmm. in that? Well, it's hard to know because when you're working on something and, again, where it's coming from some real life, because it is based on my parents. I won't lie about that. The, the book is actually based on, on my parents, but Caitlin is different than me and the characters around her are different and the scenes are different. So that part isn't actually true. But, and, I, and again, too, I think, I mean, I think this book is my tribute to them. As you said, it's a document to them, and um, they're just such amazing characters, I think. Um, and I'm hoping my love for them, and, 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 and not all, always, like, I mean, they're not perfect people. Um, so that's part of the novel, so read it. <laughs> and, uh, no, but I, I guess the thing is, too, um, it, uh, I can't even remember your question now. <laughs> I, I was wondering, what was the process of writing oh how, about the first how, chapter how yes. different was the process yeah. of writing this from mm -hmm. what you're usually doing when you're writing poems? yeah yeah I, you know it's like you're stabbing in the dark and you're just trying things but the thing about it is and I talk about this with my students too you know you kind of work from an unconscious level and your unconscious is so powerful knows so much more than we think and then you kind of come from it from the sort of cold eye you know Yates talks about that cast a cold eye on life on death horsemen pass by so you, then you got that cold eye and think, well, what am I trying to do? And what might I do? So I think of a painter. I was ta some of my Humber students are here, and I was talking about t today about, you know, think about writing as painters, too, as what, what kind of painting would it be? Or, you know, you need a bit more red here, a little best, less blue, and bring something out. So it's really, um, and I can't even remember anymore because it's just, you know, and then working with Alex. The manuscript was there, but then we had all these little pockets of things that just brought it to life even more, um, which was just amazing. And, and it really, um, as I say, it was a hard process to leave when well, it ended. Well, one thing that you don't have a lot of in poetry usually is the dialogue. I mean, yes. you, you're, you, you know how to make pictures. You do that already, and they're there. Um, so was it difficult to, to, to find the right words, or did they come naturally? They actually came quite naturally, and I guess too, I mean, I've always been a listener, and the rhythm of voices, and I had a lot of, and that's the thing you don't do in poetry so much. It's not that you can't do dialogue in poetry, but I loved working with dialogue and having the characters speak, especially Don, because he was a talker, so I could just like play with that and have fun. Caitlin um, might have Caitlin's life might, have, might, have, might turn out yet to be quite bad, but you feel at the end of the book that it's not going to, in spite of everything, in spite of the loss, the grief, of being an orphan, of losing her home, of having uh, an iffy therapist, and some <laughs> couple of sleazy men in her life otherwise. Mary Lou. Not all of them. <laughs> Mary Lou's giving you lots of little hints here. <laughs> There's a lot of good stuff in here. You really got to enjoy it. Uh, but you do get the feeling that her life is going to be all right. What is it that, why, why, is it, why do we feel that way? Why do you feel that way? Well, I should ask you, why do you feel that way? <laughs> How do we know her life's going to be all right? Well, I don't, of course. But there's something in the way she has managed to, uh, I think, she feels she's taking control of it. Yeah. Instead and it, of being mm -hmm. acted well, on. And again, it goes back to the sort of that quiet comment. Um, the inner life, the power of the inner life, and intuition. Things that sometimes get shut away, you know. It's, it's sort of, but we all have that voice inside us. It's all, always there. And sometimes we just need to quiet to listen to it or deal with our emotional sort of energy to find out what's beneath it. Or who are we listening to and thinking, well, they say this and they say this, so I should do this. And Caitlin, through this, kind of learns that 
she has this inner knowing and it's kind of hinted out as well and the quarry teaches her a lot of that as well too. So um, I think there's hope for all of us with that inner knowing. The stillness is important in the quarry. So do you want to read one more little bit um, oh, okay. um, before we close? Um, there was a part where you bring one of, Caitlin brings one of her bows oh, yes. home mm -hmm. reluctantly yeah. <laughs> to meet her father. Yeah. Because she's had this experience before and it didn't go that well. <laughs> sure. Would you mind with <laughs> yeah. the light? Yeah, I'll finish with this and thank you all for, for listening. I really appreciate it. Okay. We got back into the truck. So, sorry, I should just say Michael, her boyfriend, they're going to see. Um, Michael's driving Caitlin home from university. Uh, so he's going to meet the father for the first time, Don. And they're driving to the quarry. We got back into the truck and Michael parked under the carport in Nana's old space. Then we walked down the path to the side door. Words of introduction swam through my head. Dad, this is my boyfriend, Michael. No, not right. Dad, I'd like you to meet a special friend of mine. No, not right either. I was still debating what to say when I turned the knob of the unlocked door and we strode in. There, in the middle of the kitchen, stood my startled father in baggy blue boxers and white gym socks. Oh, God damn, he said and put down his beer. Michael put out his hand like it was the thing to do, the only thing when confronted with one's girlfriend's father, red-faced, half-naked. Hello, Don, said Michael, shaking my father's hand. He cringed at the sound of his first name. I'm getting changed, he said, letting go of the handshake. He turned to the doorway that led to the master bedroom. I led Michael through the other doorway, into the family room. I didn't want him to see the butt of Dad's underwear. God knows there might be skid marks. We looked out the window at what we could see, given daylight was living. living. <laughs> Can't laugh, sorry. We eyed each other and smiled, but I didn't break into laughter. We knew Dad would hear us. He'd turn the radio off. Sit, Dad said when he came back in. He was tying the string of his cotton track pants. I'll stand, said Michael, rubbing his back. Long trip. I sat. But Dad didn't sit. He wasn't about to look up at the new man in my life, a man who dared to call him Don, not Mr. Maharg. He remained standing. I hear you're an engineer. We'll be in a couple of years if all goes well. Michael wriggled his right pinky finger. I'll have an iron ring. You know how to work with your hands? He looked at Michael's hands as if they had the answer. Yeah, I know how to work with my hands. Good, Dad said, cocking his head. You can help me trim that bugger of a hedge. Dad, I said, it's getting dark out. Michael has to drive back to Hamilton. Dad looked out the window. Plenty of light out there. I looked at Michael, who was looking at my father, their eyes like wrestling hands. Plenty of light, said Michael, eyeing the hedge. Moments later, I shouted over the loud chur of the electric hedge trimmer. If this isn't dark, I don't know what is. They were taking turns, holding the ladder, climbing up the rungs, climbing back down. They were in their own battle now, the prize me, pointless. It got maddening standing there in the cold dark. So I went back inside and took the heavenly hash out of the freezer, setting the container on top of the tea towel I'd spread over my lap. I spooned cold, numbing mounds into my mouth. So, yeah, so, um, before we finish off, we have to mention there is a poetry book coming. We have to remind people again. Uh, it, the Celery... The Celery Forest, yeah. The Celery Forest Stay in tuned. September. O October, probably, yeah. <laughs> is there going to be another novel? Stay tuned. <laughs> well, that's where we'll maybe see Caitlin's uh, life post this. So, yeah, that could happen as well. You have some thoughts about that? Oh, definitely. I mean, I, I think there's a journey there that... Um, could be explored further, yeah. And where can the book be purchased apart from here tonight? From here, and Ben McNally has been supporting us. Thank you for that. Um, Shopify, um, Amazon, I shouldn't say Amazon. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the distributor will have it various places, and so it's out there. Yeah. Well, that's good. The more places, the better. <laughs> yeah. Kathy, Graham, thank you so much, and congratulations. Thanks, Mary Lou. Thank you. Thank you.